All right, so I know that the focus of this conference is on the, the junior leaders, but we were super fortunate also to get General Vile and General Stanton to come in for this. Um, two of the most passionate general officers I know in cyber. Um, so General Vile is the, um, the cyber commandant, uh, the fifth cyber commandant, and uh, he is right, right here. Okay, so um, he'll be coming up to give us a, a speech and a talk, and a motivating speech to, to get us ready for, for this conference. So with that, we'll bring him up. All right, checking. All right, outstanding. Hey, good morning. Hey, so there's one, one group in here that actually hasn't been applauded for, and so that's all the cadets that have successfully branched cyber, one of the most selective branches in the United States Army. So give it up for yourselves, and give it up for all the future cyber lieutenants. Now, I, I, I do want to be 100% clear. So I, I went infantry. Uh, so I know the guy that was last. He was number 173 out of 173 that got infantry in my year. He is now a general officer. So there's hope for all of you. Uh, don't worry about if you were at the bottom of that list. Uh, so I'm proof, and number 173 is proof as well. So really, what I want to talk to you today, next slide. We're trying to get the technology to work. All right, there we go. Okay. What is the cyber core? What is it that we do? Why is it important? And then for you all, who are we? What do we want to be when we grow up? Now, the way for me to do this, what I'm going to have to talk about, is I'm going to go through the entire history of warfare. Now, to be fair, Brian Vile got a C in military history. So some of the facts in here might be a little bit shaky, but that's OK. You know, Nobody's going to question me today. It's a beautiful thing. So in a in a place far, far away in a time long, long ago. Next slide. There we go. An infantryman named Kane took his bayonet, inserted it between the second and third rib of a man named Abel, twisted it, and he became the first infantryman. <laughs> and so began the beginning of warfare. And way back then, in the beginning of warfare, you know, it was just one-on-one. -on -one. Well, what ended up happening was we very rapidly decided to upscale operations. And so now, instead of man on man, instead of individual combat, what you had was armies. You had large groups of people. And the challenge that quickly arose for the commanders on the battlefield was, how do you command and control this? How do you give guidance and direction to the soldiers on the field? And if you think about it, we didn't have cell phones. What did they use? They used horns. They used bugle calls. They used guidons. They used colors. They used standards. And why did they do this? Because the commander visually had to look and he had to see what was going on on the battlefield. You had to wear colorful uniforms so you could understand who was yours, who was the adversary, and even with your own formations, where were the officers, where were the infantry, where were the dragoons? Because they all served different purposes and the only way to effectively command and control was visually. And you needed these guidelines, you needed these standards, and you needed something called a runner in order to go out and deliver messages on the battlefield. You know, we one of the questions last night, you know, who here's run a marathon? What was the guy that ran the marathon? Why did he run the marathon? It was a military messenger. And so always from the beginning, the military has had this challenge of command and control on the battlefield. Now, time went on and on, and then eventually we hit the Civil War. And during the Civil War, uh, and this gets back to the importance of academics within our branch in particular, uh, Dr. Major Albert Meyer, he stood up the Signal Corps. And for the Union forces on the battlefield, they did have telegraphs. You know, but you had to physically spool the wire, the wire would break, the batteries were unreliable. So generally, you were mostly using these for strategic and operational level messaging. You know, because this is infrastructure. This is difficult to run, particularly in combat, particularly on a fluid battlefield. And so what he developed was the wigwags. So if you've ever seen or you know somebody from the Signal Corps, those aren't semaphores that they're wearing. They're actually called wigwags, and it was developed by a Union officer. And the ability to communicate on the battlefield was one of the things that gave the Union Army the edge over the Confederates during the Civil War. Was it ideal? No. Did it work? In, in during that time, absolutely. It was the best thing that we had. So history goes on, and we hit this thing 
called the Second Industrial Revolution. The First Industrial Revolution was the steam engine. Second Industrial Revolution is really what led us into modern warfare. It brought us the internal combustion engine, which allowed for tanks. It brought us machine guns. It brought us mass manufacture of munitions. It brought us uh, smokeless powder. It's what brought us aviation, 1903 with the Wright brothers. The first casualty in an aircraft was actually an Army officer, an Army signal officer at that. And it was advances in field artillery. The Chinese may have invented gunpowder, but it was the French that designed a recoilless cannon that you could fire on the battlefield and didn't have to fully reset every time. And so all the trappings of what we now know as modern warfare really most of them came immediately out of that second industrial revolution. It was a huge watershed moment. But what about communications? So the challenge was modern communications were in, in, in its infancy. Had we figured out radio? Had Marconi figured out radio? Yeah, he had figured it out. But the original radios, when they put them on an aircraft in 1913, had a range of 2,000 yards, two clicks not particularly effective on the battlefield. So what did we end up using on the battlefield? And you'll see some of the pictures up there. Up in the top left, that's guys just carrying big spools of wire. Now the important thing to understand about this wire is it was wrapped in natural rubber called gutta percha, uh, and it, just, it was made by the lowest bidder. It would break all the time. And artillery, foot traffic, soldier falls, he grabs it, it, it would break. Uh, the telegraphs would work when the wires were there, but what's the challenge? Batteries. There's no 110, 220 volt up on the front lines. Batteries were unreliable, stuff didn't work, and oh, by the way, the trenches were covered in mud, muck, and everything else. So all the technical solutions generally didn't work very well, particularly going into the First World War. So what did they use for reliable communications? They used carrier pigeons. That literally is a carrier pigeon being released from the inside of a tank in order to tell the commander where they're at. They used dogs. They would put a message in a little box around, the th around its uh, neck and send it back, and hopefully it didn't run away, hopefully it didn't kill, get killed, and hopefully it would bring the message back. And they also used runners. Runners were an incredibly dangerous profession because what they had to do was negotiate the trench line from the rear areas all the way to the front in order to carry a message. So as we roll into World War I, all the trappings of modern warfare are there with the exception of communications. It just hadn't matured to that point. So World War I kicks off. The British get involved. Next slide. And the British decide they need to relieve pressure on the French at the Battle of Verdun. So in 1916, the British decide they're going to launch a massive offensive. And it was called the Battle of the Somme. And what they decided to do was something slightly different. They wanted to innovate. And so they saw the problem. They saw the problem with command and control. So once you went into no man's land, once you crossed the barbed wire in between the trench lines, you had no communications. Who here wants to be laying in mud, writing a small message to tie to a carrier pigeon's leg to send back? And who wants to be the runner that has to stand up and literally run back under machine gun fire with a message? So the British knew this. They had seen the French failures of communications on the front line. And so what the, French or what the British decided to do was they were going to do something called a creeping barrage. So what's a creeping barrage? So all creeping barrage is you drop artillery on the enemy, and then what happens is it shifts back. The infantry moves forward, takes the terrain. Once they hold the terrain, the artillery shifts again. Infantry moves forward. So you're basically slowly moving the artillery in front of your forces in order to maintain cover. Now, what was the challenge with the creeping barrage? You still had command and control difficulties. How do you know that the infantry actually secured the first line of trenches? And if you shifted the artillery too far behind the infantry, what would happen is they would lose all of their support. And then the Germans in the reserve trenches would be able to come forward, counterattack, and seize the terrain. The British knew this, so they put lots of time and lots of effort into trying to develop a finely synchronized battle plan for the Battle of the Somme where they would be able to seize the German trenches. 
So before this, what the British did is they hammered the Germans. It was originally planned for six days. There was a day of rain, uh, so they ended up seven days. Seven days, the king of battle hammered the German front lines. Some of the British commanders were told the, the Germans will be dead. You'll be able to walk across that sling arms, no man's land. Uh, what they didn't plan for was the fact that the German were actually in concrete bunkers, that artillery actually is not particularly effective against dug-in troops, and that all of that rain and all the artillery had turned no man's land into a swamp. It was flooded, concertina wire was everywhere, barbed wire was everywhere, and again, the German were still alive in their dugouts. So what happened? What were the command and control tools that they used? It's actually very simple. The British officers had a watch that was synchronized, and Lieutenant Vile did the same thing. We would synchronize our watches to make sure we were all on the same time. And then, at the anointed hour, 0730 on July 1st, the British officers blew their whistles. The British infantry got up out of the trenches and charged towards, across no man land towards the German front lines. For the first round, at 0730, the artillery shifted rearward to the German rear trenches. And what happened? Well, what happened was when the British left the trenches, the Germans heard that the artillery had shifted behind them. They got their machine guns, got up into their fighting positions, what was left of them, and they started hosing down the British. So literally, on the first set of trench lines, this beautifully well-crafted plan based on assumptions of forward progress got thrown to the four winds. And what did the artillery continue to do, according to the timetable, because of lack of communications? It continued to shift behind and relax the pressure on the Germans, who were able to reinforce the front line and roll back most of the successes. So for lack of command and control, for lack of communications, what was the reason? This is day one of the Battle of the Somme. The British lost more killed in one day than we have lost in 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan. Process that, and then remember how small of a country Great Britain is, and then how much smaller it was back then compared to today. 19,000 killed, most in the first few minutes of the attack. And for what? Very limited gains. So why? It was an inability of the commanders to leverage the information that was on the battlefield. They didn't know where they were successful. They didn't know where they were failing. They lacked the communication. They lacked the information in order to be successful. It wasn't their fault. They did the best they could. But the communications technology just wasn't there. So after World War I, we roll into World War II. Believe it or not, a standard issue for Signal Corps in World War II still included wigwag flags and carrier pigeons. OK, go to the next slide. Uh, but somewhere in the middle of there, in 1947, bonus points, who can identify what that is? That is the first transistor developed by Bell Labs in 1947. Things started to change. Technology started to change. And what ended up happening was the military started integrating it into every system. So now what we had, going through the 50s, going through the 60s, going through the 70s, what we had for the first time is we had weapons that were no longer traditionally fused. We had weapons where we could program them, where we could guide them, where we could target them, where we could use the EMS, the electromagnetic spectrum, in order to deliver effects on the target. And then what happened? 1990, the internet, the World Wide Web. And yes, that is actually the original symbol for the World Wide Web. And oh, by the way, this is the year I started at this fine institution of learning. Okay? And so what did this launch in 1990? It launched the internet. It launched what you all grew up with. It launched what I had to learn the hard way as an old person. Okay? Facebook, Amazon, the cloud, all of that was launched in 1990 with the beginning of the World Wide Web. Phenomenal, and what this really did is it allowed anyone, anywhere in the world, to access information. You guys have no idea how good it is to not have to go to the library and try to check out a book that it turns out somebody else checked out and never returned two months ago. Because you can Google it, you can find it. Huge, massive, you know, uh, just the ability to get that information. And as we're going through, and in the middle of this, something happens. 
9-11. And in 2001, we began the war in Afghanistan, and in 2003, we began the war in Iraq. So on parallel paths, you had a military that was already using the electromagnetic spectrum that now sees the capabilities that cyberspace can provide and the ability to move information, and we're fighting two wars for over 20 years. So what did we learn in fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan? First, the EMS, the electromagnetic spectrum. This is how you connect devices. This is how you communicate. Your cell phones, how is that communicating? There's no wires. It's using the electromagnetic spectrum in order to communicate. And then what's it doing? What on that physical layer, for those that know the OSI model, layer one physical, that's the EMS. What's it doing? It's passing information. And so in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, what we were able to do was take national level assets, things that company commanders, battalion commanders, brigade commanders, division commanders, never would have imagined having seen when Brian Vial was a lieutenant, you were able to push information down to the lowest level. You knew where they were, you knew what they were saying, and you knew how to go after them. The EMS in cyberspace absolutely drove any of the successes in Iraq and Afghanistan. But there's one caveat to it. It was an uncontested environment. Believe it or not, I am not aware of any Taliban hackers that delivered a cyber effect. I don't remember them ever attempting any jamming activities other than blowing up cell phone towers. This was uncontested. We were able to fight in the electromagnetic spectrum and in cyberspace without a threat, without an adversary. And what was happening while we were in Iraq and Afghanistan was our adversaries were paying attention. They were watching us learn those lessons. And what they ended up doing is they integrated it into their own militaries. The Chinese have significant EM, uh, EW, electromagnetic warfare capabilities. The Russians have significant, mostly had now, uh, had significant <laughs> electromagnetic warfare capabilities. And they both have incredible cyber actors, you know, malicious cyber actors that are able to go out and through cyberspace deliver effects. They know it and they've been planning for it. Go back up one. And they're ready for it. And I will tell you that win or lose the next large-scale contingency operation, it's going to be determined by who fights and wins in cyberspace in the electromagnetic spectrum. Who can fight and win in those domains? Okay, go to the next slide. So I'm going to hit pause on the history lesson. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to talk about the role of the cyber core. And I'm going to go into something called FM3O. You all get a little bit of this and talk a little bit about multi-domain operations. So what you see on the slide, aligned across the top, is what we call you know, the continuum of conflict. On the far left of the chart, this is peace. This is Zelensky and Putin hugging their differences out over a cold one. You know, We don't need militaries. So on the far right, that's thermonuclear conflict, you know, the worst conflict that you could imagine. And then somewhere in the middle is what we call crisis. This is where a soldier rotates their selector switch from safe to semi and squeezes the trigger. And now we are in conflict. Now lives are at risk. People are dying, whether they're ours or whether they're somebody else's. It's a gray area in there when that begins, when that ends. But competition is where we spend most of our time. And the whole goal of competition is to avoid going into conflict. Now off on the left, for those that know the snowman model, strategic operational tactical, the new doctrine, it actually has strategic national level, which is POTUS, and then it has strategic theater level, which are your geographic combatant commands, Southcom, Northcom, UCOM, uh, Indo-PACOM. And so this is really the chart that fm 3 os built. So why do I bring this up? Go ahead, go first build. So what does our branch do within this construct? So our 17 alphas and our 17 charlies and our 170 alphas, they fight to win in cyberspace in competition to prevent us from ever having to go to conflict. If you think about what almost all of your peers are going to do when they get commissioned, it's fairly useless until we roll into conflict. What can you do with a tank to deter the Russians? 
You can do live fire exercises with the poles on the border. We've called it saber rattling. Is it, effic is it effective? That's up for debate. But what we do is we are able to go and reach out through cyberspace and deliver effects against our adversaries in order to keep us in competition. So our offensive forces at the strategic national level are fighting every day, everywhere and always in the fight, to fight and win. Our DCO forces, our defensive cyberspace operation forces, are protecting our cyberspace capabilities making sure that the adversary doesn't think he can gain the upper hand by bringing down our computers, by bringing down our networks, by bringing down our weapon systems. This is the fight that's going on today. This is the fight that many of you will be given the opportunity to join. Now the reality is, can cyber keep us in competition? The answer is no. Putin was going to roll in the Ukraine regardless of what had happened. And sometimes conflict is inevitable. And when they bring it to us, the reality is you'll see DCO and OCO peak right around that crisis line, and then it's going to taper off. Most of the easy targets will be taken down. Most of the accesses will be burned. Most of the effects will be delivered. And then we roll into conflict. So what does our branch do for conflict? So at the operational and the tactical levels, what we do is three different things. This is all generally the three divisions of electromagnetic warfare. First, early on in competition. What are cyber branches doing through our 17 Bravos, our 170 Bravos, and our 17 Echoes, is they are ensuring that the commander knows what his signature is in the electromagnetic spectrum. For those of us that fought while deployed, I will tell you I never saw a radio on anything other than high power. I can also tell you that in some theaters of conflict that cueing the mic on a military handset will get you to receive artillery within five to eight minutes. So telling commanders what their signature is, making sure they know how they stick out in the electromagnetic spectrum, making sure they train that way is a huge part of what our branch does. Now as we inch closer to conflict, we'll start doing electromagnetic support. Simply put, this is targeting. This isn't intelligence work, this is targeting. What we do is we get a couple of lobs, lines of bearings, and once you have three of them, you have what's called a fix. And so that is a target that you can shoot. And the really cool thing about modern electromagnetic support is that based on the signals you are seeing, you can identify what system it is. So you can make sure that when you fire your high dollar, high cost weapons, or you commit US lives to the battlefield, that they're going after something that's worth it. And then as we roll into conflict, what our 17 Bravos and our 17 Echoes do is we do electromagnetic attack. This can be brute force jamming, just crank it up to 11, tape down the mic, or it can be delivery of special purpose electromagnetic attack, special purpose EA we call it. This is finely crafted signals that screw with the threat systems at the protocol level. These are the capabilities that our 17Ds, our capability developers, build. And they are delivered by our soldiers. So to wrap this all together, you know, and to give you guys the elevator speech, regardless of where you end up with or where you end up at in the cyber force, you need to know what the branch does. So my ask is, when somebody asks you what cyber does, answer for the branch first, and then tell them what you do. And what does the branch do? In competition, we fight and win in cyberspace to prevent us from having to go to conflict. Failing that, when we roll in to conflict, we force the adversary to fight like it's World War I. We push them back to carrier pigeons, runner on foot, and dogs. We shut down all their modern communications. We shut down their equipment. This is what our branch does. This is what you all are tasked to do. And if you think about it, we are what is different from combat 100 years ago to combat today. It's the EMS and cyberspace that knit it all together, that give the commander the information to make smart decisions at every echelon. And it's our job to protect that capability and to deny our adversaries from ever being able to use it against US citizens. So what does this mean for you? This is the third question and the last question. 
So who are we? Who's in this room? And I think it's better to talk from who are our soldiers? Go go to the next slide. So this is relatively new data. Uh, six months ago, the numbers were actually different. These are the soldiers you're going to be tasked to lead. Your average soldier in AIT is 25 years old. One out of four already has a bachelor's degree. Not some college, not an associate's degree. One out of four enlisted cyber soldiers, newly enlisted, already has a bachelor's degree. Average GT score, 119. And anecdotally, I will tell you that we have the feedback we get from CCTC. It's our common cyber core. You all get to go through it. The enlisted consistently complain that it's too easy. The officers, I am standing up a tutoring session because many of them are challenged and they say it's too hard. These are the soldiers you're being given the opportunity to lead. This is, I, I, I cannot state, I cannot emphasize enough how jealous I am of you all in this room. I'm closer to the end of my career than the beginning. You guys are just getting started. And I will tell you that the cyber soldiers of today are a far cry from the cyber soldiers that I was given the opportunity to lead. They were great Americans. These guys are top notch. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to lead these soldiers. And it's gonna require the, for you to have the same technical understanding that they have in order to give them appropriate guidance and direction. You will be solving some of the most technically demanding tasks that are out there. There are no easy problems in cyber. We've already solved all those. We need your generation to grab the reins and to solve the hard problems and to lead our soldiers in that fight. And they are incredible. Guys, truly, the future is bright. I look out at you guys, you know, and it, it really does bring a little tear to my eye. You know, wishing I was in your seat uh, instead of where I'm at. I'm at the tail end. So, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. Welcome to the Cyber Branch. All right, thank you, General Vile. Sir, if you could come up real quick. We really appreciate your talk and just want to give you a token of our appreciation. Sure.